and welcome back to my series of videos for General Chemistry 2. Today I want to point out something that we talked about way back in General Chemistry 1 that, when you think about it, seems to make half of all chemical reactions absolutely impossible. In order to understand why those reactions really are possible after all, we'll have to talk about a brand new property of molecules that we've never mentioned before. To get there, let's start by remembering some things that we saw way back when we talked about enthalpy. You might remember that reactions can have either a positive or negative enthalpy. For example, here's the reaction in which magnesium oxide and water react to form magnesium hydroxide. The enthalpy of that reaction is negative 37.1 kilojoules per mole. The enthalpy is a negative number, which means that this is an exothermic reaction. On the other hand, the reaction in which ethene breaks down to form acetylene and hydrogen has an enthalpy of positive 174.47 kilojoules per mole. Since the enthalpy is positive, this is an endothermic reaction. As we saw back in video 13, we can make a plot where we draw the potential energy of the chemicals in a reaction as the reaction occurs. If we do that for these two reactions, we get this. As you might expect, the chemicals in the exothermic reaction lose energy, so the products have a lower energy than the reactants. Meanwhile, the opposite is true for the endothermic reaction. The products have a higher energy than the reactants. But think about that for a second. Back in General Chemistry 1, we found out that atoms and molecules are more stable when they have lower energy. So, we might expect exothermic reactions to be the only ones that occur. In order to get an endothermic reaction, we need to form molecules with a higher enthalpy, which seems to mean that the products would be less stable than the reactants. But still, endothermic reactions really do occur. For example, one endothermic reaction that you may have seen occurs in cold packs that are used to prevent swelling after an injury. Here's that reaction. The reactants are kept in separate containers in the cold pack. When you squeeze the pack, the inner containers are broken so that the chemicals mix and the reaction occurs. How is it possible for reactions like this to occur? There must be a second factor, something in addition to the enthalpy, that determines whether or not a reaction can be possible. That second factor is called the entropy. One way to think about entropy is that it's the degree of disorder or randomness that a system has. The more disordered a system is, the higher its entropy. There's a much more precise technical definition of entropy, but it involves some mathematics that you probably haven't had yet. You'll learn all about it if you take a course in physical chemistry, which I hope you do take someday. Anyway, as I said, the entropy is a measure of how disordered a system is. How can you tell whether chemicals have a high or a low entropy? It turns out that there are several ways. The most important way has to do with the phase of the chemicals. For example, in a solid, the molecules have a fairly orderly location. They're locked into a specific crystal shape and don't move around very much. On the other hand, in a liquid, the molecules move a bit faster so they can escape their intermolecular forces enough to move around. But still, they stick together enough to be held in the bottom of the container that they're in. Finally, the molecules in a gas are able to move around freely anywhere in the container. In these examples, the solid has a low entropy because the molecules are arranged in a pattern that has a very small amount of disorder. On the other hand, the molecules in a gas can be in any random location in the container, so gases have a much higher entropy than solids or liquids. So, the entropy depends on the phase of the molecules. It also depends on the number of different compounds present. For example, suppose you had two samples of gas. In one, the gas is made up of only one compound, so every molecule in the gas is the same. The other gas is a sample of three different compounds. In that case, the three kinds of molecule are distributed randomly throughout the gas. If you were to reach into the second container and grab one molecule, you might get any of the three possibilities. But in the first container, you'd always get the same kind of molecule. 
That makes the first guess more orderly. It has a lower entropy than the second sample. A third factor that affects the entropy is the number of molecules there are. The greater the number of molecules, the more possible places the molecules can be located, so the higher the disorder. That means that the entropy is higher when there are more molecules present. For example, consider this chemical reaction. In this case, two ozone molecules react to form three oxygen molecules. We can determine whether the reactants have a higher entropy or the products. We just need to remember the three factors I just mentioned. The most important one is the phase. Remember, gases have a higher entropy than liquids or solids. In this case, the reactants and products are both gases. So we'll move on to the next factor. The second most important factor tells us that the entropy is higher when there are more different compounds. In this reaction, there's just one kind of compound on each side, so that doesn't help us. Finally, the third factor I mentioned is the number of molecules on each side. This time, there's an important difference. There are two ozone molecules on the reactant side and three oxygen molecules on the right, so the products have a higher entropy. We can use those three simple rules to help us figure out whether the entropy goes up or down in lots of different chemical reactions. But why should we care about the entropy that much? Well, it turns out that every spontaneous process, such as a chemical reaction, always results in an increase in the entropy of a closed system. That's a very important principle, so important that it gets its own name, the second law of thermodynamics. The second law has a big impact on lots of phenomena in chemistry and physics, so I want to point out a couple of important things about it. First, notice that the second law has three parts, and all three of them are important. If you ask a non-scientist what the second law of thermodynamics says, often they'll say that the second law of thermodynamics states that every chemical reaction results in an increase in entropy. But that's not true. There are lots of reactions in which the entropy actually goes down. One of these is actually really familiar to you. Suppose you want to freeze water. In that case, you're going from a liquid to a solid, and we said a minute ago that solids have a lower entropy than liquids. The reason why freezing water doesn't break the second law of thermodynamics is because of the specific things the second law says. First, the second law is for spontaneous processes. That means things that will happen on their own without the need to put energy into the reaction. It also says that the second law is for a closed system. That means the system is isolated so that no energy or matter can get in or out. In the case of our freezing water, we have to take energy out of the water in order to freeze it. So this isn't a closed system and that means it doesn't violate the second law of thermodynamics. So, what the second law is telling us is that the disorder or randomness of a closed system always increases. That makes sense. For example, when you shake a box containing a jigsaw puzzle, you find out that the pieces inside end up in a random order, which means it has a high entropy. What you don't expect is to open the box and find that the pieces just happen to have fallen together in just the right way to make the final picture. That would be a very non-random, low-entropy way for the pieces to land, so we don't expect that to happen. That's partly because there are millions of different ways for the pieces to mix together in the box, but only one of those would actually result in the finished picture, and that would almost never happen. So, let's use what we've learned. Here's a chemical reaction in which sodium bicarbonate and hydrochloric acid react to form CO2, water, and sodium chloride. Does the entropy increase or decrease during this reaction? To find out, we just remember those three factors that we saw earlier. The first one is the phase. In this reaction, we start with a solid and an aqueous compound, and we end up with a gas, a liquid, and another aqueous compound. 
So, overall, we've exchanged a solid compound for a gas in a liquid. Both of those have a higher entropy than the solid, so the entropy in this reaction goes up. Also, notice that the number of different compounds increases. We have two on the reactant side and three on the product side. That's another reason why the entropy will increase. Finally, notice that the number of molecules also increases from two to three. So all three of the factors that can affect the entropy all work to make the entropy go up in this reaction. Here's another example. In this reaction, will the entropy go up or down? In this case, the phase is the same for all of the molecules, so that won't affect the entropy. However, there are two different compounds on the reactant side and just one on the product side, so that'll make the entropy decrease. Also, we're going from a total of three molecules for the reactants to two for the products. That also will make the entropy decrease. But notice what that means for these two reactions. Since the entropy increases in the first reaction, it can happen spontaneously even if it's in a closed system. And here's that reaction. As you can see, we're starting with solid sodium bicarbonate, which is the same thing as baking soda, and one of the products is CO2 gas, which you can see bubbling out of the beaker. On the other hand, the entropy decreases in the second reaction, so that one won't happen spontaneously in a closed system. If we want to make that reaction happen, we'll need to put energy in, which means it won't be a closed system anymore. You might have noticed that our definition of entropy is a little bit vague. We said it's the amount of disorder in a system, but how do you quantify disorder? How can we put a number on something that's as hard to define as the amount of randomness? One thing we can do is to try to decide what something would look like if it had no disorder at all. What would a system look like if it had zero entropy? Well, remember that the phase is the most important factor in determining whether or not something has a high or a low entropy. If we want to make a compound with an entropy of zero, this gives us a hint on how to do it. If we change our compound to a solid, that will have a lower entropy than a liquid or a gas. But even solids like this salt crystal don't have a zero entropy. The atoms in the crystal can still move and vibrate a little, so there's still a little bit of randomness in their positions. If we want to prevent that, we need to get the atoms to completely stop moving. How would you do that? From the work you did with gas laws in General Chemistry 1, you might remember that molecules move more slowly at lower temperatures. So, if we want to make them stand still, we need to lower the temperature all the way down to absolute zero. When that happens, we'll have what's called a perfect crystal, and the entropy will be zero because the atoms in the crystal will not be moving. In fact, that's what's known as the third law of thermodynamics. The third law says, the entropy of a perfect crystal is zero at a temperature of absolute zero. As we'll see in the next video, that'll make it possible to determine exactly what the entropy is for all kinds of systems at higher temperatures. And it'll make it possible for us to finally understand why endothermic reactions are possible, even though the products have a higher potential energy than the reactants. I hope you'll join me for the next video. Until then, have a good week.